Madhouse Podcasting Network. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? I am fresh uh, off a Ice Cube and Snoop Dogg concert, so bear with me a little bit. <laughs> uh, I'm here with a good friend of ours who's been on the podcast, no stranger to the podcast, uh, Mr. AJ Dana. How you doing, my friend? Hello, hello. Good to see you again, my friend. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us again for Scaractor Appreciation Month. Um, and man, this year you had a good uh, a good role this year, man. You were uh, casted into bride of frankenstein lives talk to us a little bit about how you felt getting casted into that and and overall what your overall experience was for that sure well i had a fantastic time working as one of the brides of dracula in the bride of frankenstein lives uh this was my ninth season of doing halloween events and but it was my first time working with the universal monsters brand which was very very exciting to fall into that at this time not only for my personal enjoyment, but because this maze was so cool and really groundbreaking. Like I was very, very proud to be part of that. Yeah, I mean, dude, talk about uh, freaking icons of Universal right there, man. That absolutely it doesn't back, get dude. it really doesn't get much better than the classic monsters. If you're talking about that Halloween feeling, you know, yeah. uh, being able to actually genuinely say I was working in the lab late one night like the monster mash <laughs> says but actually mean i was working in the lab late one night it's it's very cool you know it's very gratifying and the team of performers that we had bringing these icons to life all the brides of frankensteins and the frankenstein monsters and the brides of dracula like these were you know these iconic characters were in very good hands this year on both coasts yeah. both in california and orlando i got to visit the orlando attraction this year as well also exceptional Dude. it was really quite cool to be part of bringing these stories back to life yeah no it was really cool i like to hear the uh the story murdy gave to at awaken the spirits when he said that uh he had no plans of doing a, a third universal monsters until he went over to orlando and saw their story and he kind of adapted his story on his own like spiritual sequel to the bride which you know it's always been a fan favorite of when i like when murdy takes the universal monsters property and kind of puts his own twist on it almost like uh sequels or whatnot um that don't really exist uh that being said bride of frankenstein lives was almost was pretty much a spiritual sequel to the bride of frankenstein of what she would do after the fact that all the aftermath just happened you know she had lost uh the monster and now she wants to bring back the monster for an eternity of love so it's it's truly a it, it you know it, it's supposed to be scary but in reality it's truly a love story mm -hmm. absolutely no i agree and i think the uh it was interesting you should mention that about Florida because the two mazes did kind of go hand in hand. Uh, they had different elements featured in each of them, like the Hollywood maze featured the blind man's cabin from Bride of Frankenstein, right. the movie, and uh, the sequences in the forest and sort of leading up to how the bride became this doctor character, how she captured the Dracula brides, whereas the Orlando maze it started at the same point with the castle exploding from the end of the film, but sort of jumped right into that. So they both had incredible elements, but it was really cool that if you did both, you caught kind of the whole story, which was really nifty. Right. So talk to us a little bit about uh, a casting, getting casted into this. I mean, you, so you go, you audition. Uh, did you just audition to just be part of the event or were you had your eyes set on something specific? Like how, what was casting like for you going into this uh, progress uh, process? Sure. Well, this was my fourth year of Halloween Horror Nights. I also worked 2015, 2016 and 2017. So coming back into this, I was a part of the pool, which is probably my favorite thing to do at Horror Nights. That's where you get to fill a different spot every night, uh, depending on who has dropped out or called out for the night. 
Uh, there's a lot of casting reassignments when it comes to pool to fit whatever they need that night. Uh, and I was in a couple of other attractions before I fell into a permanent role in The Bride of Frankenstein Lives. I also worked in uh, Pandora's Box and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Haunting of Hill House, and uh, fell into Bride of Frankenstein and uh, ended up there permanently, which was a blast. I mean, that was not only a role I felt very comfortable doing, it was a very fun character. Uh, but it was a great cast and a great story as well. So I consider myself very lucky and very grateful to have fallen into that. Oh, hands down, brother. I, I and I say this this year, Bride of Frankenstein Lives was hands down my favorite um, out of all the mazes that they had this season. Uh, mainly because you know you can't go wrong with the Universal monsters, whether they put a, a new twist on them or it's an old twist with just a, a new take on it. You know, I mean. It, whatever it may be, I mean, it's just a lot of fun going through that. I, I enjoy seeing what they come up with, what how scary they made them. I mean, it, it was really cool to see the evolution of it, it, all three of them have included Frankenstein's monster. And, you know, you started with Universal Monsters, which you saw all that, which Frankenstein's monster was kind of like the the guy that made the entire place at the end blow up, which was really cool. Um, and then you go into uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, uh, another solid maze, a, a good little versus maze that we saw between Frankenstein's monster and the Wolfman, which was really cool. And then you go into the Bride of Frankenstein Lives, um, where you're seeing a different perspective of who's in, who's telling the story and who's in charge now, which is the bride's turn. And you're seeing kind of the Frankenstein's monster be kind of more a secondary character rather than a main character. So you're seeing a new lead take over. Um, which was really cool. And then to top it off, you added the Brides of Dracula in it, uh, who, after all this has gone down, uh, you know, the Bride of Frankenstein has come up with this plan to bring back her, um, you know, her love, the love of her life, and she decides vampire's blood. That's going to be the, the key to immortality. Um, and so you, see, you start seeing the story of her going onto this hunt, capturing... Uh, the brides of Dracula and all this, all this good stuff. Um, with all that being said, dude, you getting to play one of the brides of Dracula. Um, where were you specifically set into the maze, or were you out in the scare zone? Like, how did that work out for you? So I started as one bride of Dracula and then moved to a different one because, again, coming from the pool, it depends on which spots are available at certain right. times. I started as one of the blonde brides of Dracula in the woods and in the cabin. And then the one that I took the permanent spot as was in the laboratory, in the cages, and in the feeding cages after the laboratory. And a fun fact for those who maybe don't realize, because it you had to go through the maze a couple times to see, it was the same three Dracula brides appearing in different progressions throughout the maze. So there right. was a brunette, a blonde, and a redhead. And so the three Dracula brides start, you know, pristine condition. They haven't been you know, attacked yet by the Bride of Frankenstein. And then one of them gets a cross burned into her forehead and one gets stitches on her forehead. That's the one I was, the, the black hair had the stitches. Right. Um, and then one gets, you know, staked through the heart. So throughout the maze, you see how the Bride of Frankenstein hunted these particular Dracula brides over the years to continue to drain them of their blood and finally captured them, kept them alive to, cap to take their blood. And then <laughs> so it was a, a really fun story to be part of and uh i know what some of you are probably thinking i will be here to clarify all of the bride of frankensteins were women yes. and about 80 percent of the brides of dracula were also women there was three or four uh men uh male identifying performers uh including myself with more androgynous bodies uh who could play uh both but it was incredibly exciting to be part of a maze that was female driven these are super badass uh you know turning the tables this isn't a frankenstein maze this is the bride of frankenstein this is her world she's powerful she is fierce and i absolutely love being part of that dude shout out to by the way shout out to all the women who played the bride i mean hands down i mean it was cool to see the concept art over at awaken the spirits but to, to live it and walk through it I mean, it, it was like literally bringing everything to life. Murdy and, and, and Chris and, and the, the entire team, they brought that, that story to life. And, and to see the uh, amazing women they cast as the bride to, to further uh, drive that story to life, it was, it was incredible. I mean, they did a yes. phenomenal job. So a big shout out to them because uh, without them, it's just called um, 
It's just called Frankenstein Lives. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. Or if you take the whole Bride of Frankenstein, it's just called Lives. It's just called that's Lives. Not, there it is. Not very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and a huge, huge shout out to our scare actor of the year in the maze, the real Sweet Spice, who was one of my Bride of Frankenstein's in the laboratory. It was such a treat for me to not only work with these talented performers every night, but from the you know, I encourage everybody who wants to work in the haunt field to be a fan of these stories, to be a fan of these these moments and these properties, because you enjoy it so much more if you are both a fan and a working professional. Yep. So for me to be able to, you know, bring my talent to the table and be a part of telling the story, there's also that 15 percent left in me that goes, look, it's the Bride of Frankenstein. Look, it's Frankenstein's <laughs> monster. You know, it's like to be able to look around and see these amazing performers bringing these characters to life all around me in a living, breathing story that I get to be part of. There is nothing more special when it comes to continuing these, these stories. And those performers really brought their A game. I mean, it goes without saying too, that literally right down the hill on the lot is where they filmed a lot of these iconic films too. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And to, to be not only a part of that story, but to be at the location where a lot of those films were made back in the 30s and the 40s and, and the 50s. You know, I mean, the sequels went on for until the 60s. You know what I mean? But oh yeah, to, to be part of a part of that kind of legacy to to continue to keep the Universal monsters alive and also immerse audiences into those stories. I mean, it's got to be a, a huge, like you said, it's a it's a huge it's a huge honor. And then to work with a, a really talented cast who helped bring those stories to life uh, along yourself. I mean, it is just, it's, it's, I mean, as a guest perspective, I mean, I, I'm like a kid in a candy store, man. You, you put me into this maze and I'm just losing it. I'm freaking out. It's, it's a fun time, man. I, I really do enjoy going through these universal monster mazes every single year to see what they can come up with next. And this year, out of, I think this year so far, I mean, universal monsters was good, but this one is like neck and neck with that one. Like it, it's, it's hard for me to choose a favorite because every year they've been so good, but like, I really fell in love with the story and aesthetics of this one. I'm really resisting the urge to make a neck and neck pun about vampires. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it's man. funny that you should mention, um, the fact that it's all like happening there on the back lot and how we're like continuing to tell the stories where they were told because they're in a way the Universal Monsters characters and their respective stories have continued to go on yeah. in pretty much every decade, whether or not it was as much in the forefront as it is now. You know, there were comic books and trade paperbacks throughout the 90s and the 2000s that were writing sequels to monster characters. In fact, I have right here a book. This was uh, The Wolfman versus Dracula is an actual script that was acquired by universal in you know the original golden age of monsters that they were intending to make as a technicolor monster film right. and it didn't end up happening but it's interesting to hear how many expanded universe so to speak universal monster stories there are uh whether it was screenplays that didn't get produced or paperbacks or comics and so to be able to have these stories continuing through immersive themed entertainment that you can walk through you can see you don't just have to use your imagination what a special way to be telling these stories, like in the place where the original Golden Age monsters were shot. I mean, this the stories never died, but to be able to do it like this is yeah. just amazing. <laughs> it's also it's uh, I, the reason why I like Horror Nights bringing over the Universal monsters uh, to today's audiences is because there's a younger generation out there that go to haunt and whatnot that may have never even heard of these monsters. They they probably know a lot of like the more of the slashers and whatnot and you know, Michael Myers and, and, you know, Leatherface and stuff. But a lot of people don't realize that if it weren't for these icons that started it back in the 30s, those icons wouldn't have spawned later on in, like, the 70s and the 80s and whatnot because these are the ones that – this was the – really the start of the genre of horror. This is when horror started really coming up, and it wasn't really as what it is today, you know, as it is today back in the day – like when these movies came out, this was a whole new genre pretty much being introduced to audiences and to see this grow and to see this become something, a staple of Universal. I mean, and then to, for, the, for, you know, for Horror Nights to adapt these these properties and make them more scarier and, and to, to modernize them in a way that that can feel scarier um, to new audiences is really good because now we get to get, you know, a, a, like I said, a younger generation of of audiences into the Universal Monsters. They want to go back and rewatch these films and, you know, 
just get a bunch of knowledge as they can to who these characters are. So it's a really good learning curve for uh, old school fans, for new fans. You know, it's it's really it's really fun to see all that. I absolutely agree. And I think characters like Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein have become cultural icons. I mean, there are many people that will know flathead, bolt screen, uh, lightning bolt, tall hair. You know, it's they've become so iconic, but they have also kind of become removed from their stories and because they do just kind of stand on their own as icons. So to be able to bring these very uh, famous, <laughs> famous monsters of film land, pun intended, yeah. to bring these famous monsters back into this environment where we can share them with younger viewers or younger audiences and introduce them to not only these characters as icons, but also the worlds they come from, the stories, the emotional background of why the Bride of Frankenstein is on her quest, you know, to be able to, to present the whole story is really exciting. And within the Universal Monsters world, they were one of cinema's first shared universes. Yeah. You know, prior to the boom of cinematic universe crossovers, the Universal Monsters were doing it all the way back then. I mean, even Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein is one of my favorite Universal Monsters films. You've got all the big baddies in one film in this shared universe. So the fact that even through these mazes at Halloween Horror Nights, we're seeing crossovers. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, like the film. Bride right. of Frankenstein versus Brides of Dracula. Like, it's it's very exciting to have not only these icons, but the worlds they come from being presented for today's audiences. I, I, I couldn't agree more, man. Now, um, you being uh, working at one of the uh, scariest probably events in SoCal, um, obviously the, the, the company that's known for bringing some of your favorite horror movies to life and whatnot, it, it has to come with uh, a couple of uh, funny moments that you've had work in this event. Now, uh, you being one of the uh, the the um, the brides of, of Dracula, man. I mean, and you've probably gotten to see a lot of stuff with your coworkers and whatnot, and and different uh, environments and whatnot. Off the top of your head, do you remember any funny instances where people maybe got dropped in mazes or just couldn't take it too much? Like, I, I already see you smiling, so you got some stuff. Oh, I definitely do. Uh, something that was very educational about this experience, something that I encourage all male identifying scare actors to try is walk a mile in a woman's shoes because you will learn so much about being a woman or what women have to go through on a daily basis, not only in the world, but in, in the haunt world, especially. And watching the transition of how these scares were designed of when you know, you're a Dracula bride, you're in the cages and it's almost a little more seductive. Uh, you know, they're looking at these brides of Dracula as you know, very voluptuous, sensual creatures. And then you hit your trigger with the strobe effect and the scary sounds. These characters are sirens, you know, you see them and you think, oh, wow, they're so beautiful. And then, and then and they attack and that's when they, they rip your neck to shreds and watching these men come through this maze and think they can just come take advantage of us or they can, you know, touch us or make dirty gestures or faces at us and then show that women and female characters can be just as scary as the slashers that we see in the 70s and 80s. And we can lash out and tear your throats out and watch them drop to the floor, completely <laughs> not expecting these female characters to attack them that way. That was a huge honor to be part of that and watching oh my, my my female identifying castmates go ham on these guys, like really scaring the crap out of all these completely unsuspecting guests. It was so much fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude, I, I have to say, and I agree with you 100%, man. You look at a lot of the women in cinema and um, the ones who've played uh, horror icons and, you know, you go back and you look a little bit. Um, it's a couple I could think off the top of my head right now. Uh, Megan Fox's character in Jennifer's Body. Um, yes. Obviously an iconic film. Uh, it's become a cult classic and to see her character, obviously someone who was misrepresented to be one thing. And then when it was come time to do a sacrifice, didn't work in exactly their favor and the demon comes back for revenge and it feeds and whatnot. Uh, that's definitely one. Obviously you got the bride. Um, the iconic bride is, I, I would say the first one to ever really take that stage as a leading, a uh, horror, um, woman icon and she really sets the bar for a lot of uh women icons to come in you know future uh projects and whatnot because she is the og and she is the first she is the queen 
you can even properly give her that title because she is the queen of horror. She is. That's right. She identifies what horror is as a as a female horror icon. So when you think, you know, when you think of all these horror icons, you can't go without thinking about her first. That's right. And when Universal continued that uh, that legacy with characters like the She Wolf of London. Dracula's daughter, uh, being able to bring all of those silver screen queens together in the scare zone attached yes. to the Bride of Frankenstein lives. And you had Aung San Suu the mummy, She Wolf of London, Dracula's daughter. Like to see these characters all come together in this one scare zone was so cool. And obviously I don't know anything about what the future of the event holds, but if I could just uh, make a suggestion as a, a fellow fan and a performer, I would love to see Silver Scream Queens expanded into a whole maze. So all of these badass female horror icons can be given their due in a whole maze. I'm I'm cool with that one. That one, that, that does sound cool to give them more of a storyline uh, to continue the success off the, uh, the, uh, the women of horror. Uh, it's definitely something that uh, we can definitely improve on as well as, as going into a, a new uh, a new world, a new state. You know, we need to, we need to improve on more things like that. Um, Absolutely. Another one I would love to see, too, if we're talking universal monster ideas out there. I yeah. mean, I feel like we haven't even seen the creature yet, man. And, and I got to... This is true. We need to have like a, a universal monsters creature feature or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think we need to get something out there for the creatures, man, of, of universal cinema. I absolutely agree. That would be wonderful to see. Um, if anybody out there has played the Creature from the Black Lagoon pinball machine, uh, those of you who recall, it has a very different aesthetic than the 1930s and 40s monster films. It's not gothic castles. It's a 50s drive-in. The, yeah. the pinball machine essentially is a creature feature sci-fi creature from the Black Lagoon <laughs> is jumping out of the screen in 3D. And there's a whole other vibe to be found with that era of monster films uh you know the schlocky monsters of the 50s and 60s and you know universal orlando has done something along those lines you had the maze creatures uh a couple of years back but to to be able to tie that into creature from the black lagoon and bring that sci-fi monsters angle would be very exciting and i've personally seen the now closed prize electronics store in burbank was themed to schlocky 1950s movie monsters with giant aliens and ants and an octopus smashing through the wall that that aesthetic has not been tapped into enough in the haunt world i think i would oh, like man. to see more of that you brought back a throwback of fries man i forgot they closed all those stores down <laughs> Oh, it was man. so sad. It oh was. man, that was one of the only retail experiences outside of a park that brought themed entertainment and shopping together. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so it's safe to say you had a really good season at Halloween yes. Hornets this year, uh, being part of that story, being part of that iconic story and whatnot. Um, so now we've heard, of course, the bride side of things. You did mention you got to play other roles uh, throughout the night uh, or throughout the season in the beginning. Uh, you've mentioned Texas, you mentioned Hill House, you mentioned a Pandora's Box. How were those experiences as well leading up to, of course, your 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 final uh, role in The Bride? I mean, how were those experiences uh, pretty much mentally preparing you to to play this role in The Bride and whatnot? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I had played Grandpa in Texas Chainsaw Massacre in 2016 and 2017 as well for a couple of nights. So getting to do Grandpa again for a night this year was a lot of fun. I have a lot of really good memories with my supervisors and my friends relating to the Texas Chainsaw IP. So that was, of course, a lot of fun. Right. And I played the basement ghost in The Haunting of Hill House which was a lot of fun. Again, having seen both the Orlando and the Hollywood version of that attraction, it was nice to see the whole story. Right. And I also spent some time in Pandora's box as one of the skeletons in the cages, which was a fantastic spot for dropping people. I mean, I've played 30 characters for Universal and this was like top five for jump scares, which was amazing. So I had a great time doing that. And then that led to Bride of Frankenstein. Bride of Frankenstein lives, man. And again, to end it at one of the most iconic uh, properties of Universal's uh, cinematic history, man. I mean, such an honor right there. But to get to play all those roles leading up to that, that's just really cool to have you get to kind of experience different things and, and check out what there is to offer at Universal. Like I said, I had a friend who who worked at, um, at Horror Nights this year, and he got to do the exact same thing. He got to go to uh, Leatherface in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He got to do the Terror Tram. He got to be uh, one of the Chainsaw guys on the Terror Tram. Um, and then, of course, he ended the season for getting a permanent spot in Halloween 4 
as Michael nice. Myers. So, it, which is ironic for him because uh, his uh, Instagram and TikTok handle is Michael Myers underscore the shape, and he cosplays as Michael Myers. So, there you go. <laughs> it's like it's honestly just for him. It was just getting some more practice in to 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 do more things later on with his TikToks. So that's hilarious. Sure, yeah. You know, Destiny has a way of working out like that, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, man. So, I mean, you, you got to have a great season this year, a great return season for Halloween Horror Nights this year. Um, but to my knowledge, also with Halloween Horror Nights, you had some other stuff to do outside of Horror Nights on different nights to do, right? Yes, I did. Thank you for asking about that. I did. Uh, on Wednesdays and sometimes Monday and Tuesdays when the schedule opened up, I was working at Hauntoween, yep. which was a family-friendly walkthrough experience in Woodland Hills. It was essentially a very large Halloween carnival. And if anybody out there attended the Hauntoween drive through in 2020, this was that but much bigger. And the character that I play for Hauntoween is a stand-up comedy skeleton named Funny Bones who tells terrible dad jokes, Halloween puns all night. And I have an amazing time doing it. And it is a total 180 from Halloween Horror Nights because it is a family friendly event. Yeah. It is meant for kids. So having to get like all angles of Halloween in one season, both the family friendly side and the Universal Monster side, what I, I genuinely can't ask for more. And especially to be working seven days a week with that. This was I was gonna say one of, you had yeah. a very busy schedule then come time I Halloween. It was it was Monday <laughs> through Sunday just whether it would be family friendly Halloween or a more PG thirteen rated R Halloween, I mean, it was the the the, the, the it switched real quick, man. It really did. It's hilarious. <laughs> and you know what? I wouldn't have it any other way. I feel like you know this was really the Halloween season of all the ones I've done where. I feel like I got to have my hand in a lot of different things that feel like my Halloween, like things that I personally care about, things that had an influence on me when I was growing up in this industry. And I was also the uh, main gate voice for LA Haunted Hayride this year and the safety yeah. skills. So I was going to ask about that because I, I figure since season's over, NDAs are probably cleared now. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I did recognize that voice. I can't I can't forget that voice. I've recognized that voice for the last two, three years now, and I can't I can't forget it. So. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Yeah, it was great to still be part of the Midnight Falls story, even though I wasn't there in the town this year. It was great that I was still part of the part of bringing the world of Midnight Falls to life. Uh, yeah. You know, I just I really am. I'm very grateful. I, I, I honestly don't think I have much more to say about this season than the word gratitude, you know, and to take pieces of it with me. I want to also give a shout out to one of our costumers at Bride of Frankenstein who made these embroidered jackets. Going back to what we were saying about it's not Frankenstein, it's Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. Frankenstein's monster was on a lot of the merchandise this year and the Bride of Frankenstein wasn't on as much merchandise. Yeah, and we of, were kind of was like, uh, what's going on here? Like, yeah, definitely. We all kind of had that feeling of like, mm, you know, and it was it was cool merch. Don't get me wrong, but it yeah. should have been the bride. So for our cast and crew jackets, one of our customers made these with the, the Bride, the bride of Frankenstein on the back, which has quickly become one of my favorite souvenirs. So thank you, Christiana. I can, I can, uh, I, I can already name so many people who are going to be wanting that jacket so bad that don't work <laughs> Halloween harness that are fans much like myself that just would love that jacket. Well, all I can say is uh, audition for Halloween Horror Nights there next year, and you never know what cast and crew merch you'll end up getting at the end of the season. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, I mean, it's cool to see that you got to have – different uh points of view for halloween this year i mean obviously yes. you grow up into the world of halloween as a kid it's more of the family friendly side and then at a certain age you start hitting that point where you want to see more uh, violence and gore and whatnot and halloween uh specifically with horror movies and whatnot and to see you get to work about you know three or so days uh doing a family friendly event kind of entertaining children entertaining families and then to go four days at a different event and kind of, you know, turn off one switch and flip on the other and scare the hell out of audiences. Um, that, that is, that is awesome, man. To see you go from a family favorite character to a, a, a terrifying character. I mean, just, I mean, the acting chops are there, man. He could just <laughs> turn it off and on like that. No problem. Oh, I appreciate that, my friend. And, and truly, it was an honor to get to do it because, you know, Halloween is so special uh, in each phase of your life. I, I actually heard a, a conversation with Michael Doherty, a uh, buddy of mine who directed the movie Trick or Treat. Right. He was doing a Q&A at the Egyptian Theater, and he said, 
the point of the film trick or treat is to show that Halloween changes throughout your life. You start with a certain type of Halloween when you're younger and it's magic and candy. And then sometimes people who are teenagers, it becomes partying and exploring the naughty side of things. And then as you get older, you experience Halloween from a parent's point of view and you get to see it through your kid's eyes. And then sometimes people are older and they're tired of Halloween. And that's Mr. Krieg, you know, all oh, these mischievous kids. And it's funny because this Halloween season was very much like that for me. You, you had both the young phase with the children and the magic and the candy, which is still how I see Halloween too. So yep. to have that and then go to the scarier, gorier, you know, classic monster side of things was, it was very special. And, you know, to have that kind of range in one season is something that I, I don't take for granted. And speaking of things I don't take for granted, Big shout out to you and the Knights of Horror podcast for mm. having an appreciation for what we do as yeah. performers, you know, to have Scare Actor Appreciation Month to, you know, really celebrate, you know, what it takes to be a scare actor. Like, that's why I consider you not only an exceptional podcaster, but also my friend, because I think you oh, understand this man. from a, a nice perspective. So thank you. Making me feel all kinds of things <laughs> right now. Come on. <laughs> no, uh, no, we appreciate that, man. We've always said uh, and and we've heard some really uh, we've heard stories, trust me. I mean, the the main part of this podcast is to uh, appreciate the monsters. This is not about us. This is about your guys' stories, your guys' um, experiences, and whether they'll be – because you're going to hear a mix of emotions throughout these podcasts. Like I, I told these characters, like if whatever they need to vent out there, I mean, don't hold back. You know, have it. Have at it. I've heard uh, some really, really s sucky stories from, from experiences from scare actors that you'll hear – uh, the, or you've already heard because that, that podcast probably already out. Um, you'll hear some amazing stories. You'll hear some great stories. You'll hear some, you know, it's not you know, some sad stories. Some different. You'll, you, it's a mix of emotions with these. Basically, you, this these podcasts are for you guys to come on and seriously just vent about your haunt season because I want to hear it. I want to just try to sp send a message out there, whether it be have a good time, don't touch scare actors. That's obviously the biggest one. Um, be responsible if you're gonna if you decide to drink. Be responsible about it. Uh, you know, just just so we could preach these messages. And and my my buddy put it great yesterday. She told me what we're trying to do here is normalize Halloween and not make it for just the Halloween fans, but for everyone to listen to. That way, they can if they want to audition for these events, if they want to learn more behind the scenes about these events through specific characters. Um, they can watch these podcasts and learn and educate themselves and enjoy them because that's what they're for. They're for you guys. Absolutely. They're not for us. You know, we like, we want to hear your stories, not we, you already know our story. Now it's time to hear your guys' stories. Well, I appreciate that. And, and I also agree because, you know, to be able to, to understand and respect that beyond these characters that we see in the streets and in the mazes are people. And I think the more, both the public and themed entertainment enthusiasts come to realize that, uh, you know, behind every scary monster is somebody who maybe uh, works with kids or somebody who is a, a firefighter. Like people come from all walks of life to come gather around Halloween performing every year at all of our respective events. You know, we're all one team. We all leave our normal lives behind for a month to do this. And I think there is, a certain level of art to that. Like there's a special magic to that, that right. all of these people from all walks of life bond over this one very special magical thing. And so to have anybody out there who's willing to listen, to hear our stories, you know, where we come from, why we do what we do, why we're here, and not only to scare the hell out of you, but to become a part of a family that gets to do this every year, that, that really means the world. Thank you. Also, anyone out there, uh, Need some casting for anything. AJ is a legitimate actor, so if you never need to cast him in anything, I guarantee you he's not going to let you down. You gotta, oh, I appreciate that. You got to promote that. the work out there, man. You got to get it out there. got to get the name out there. But no, uh, AJ, you are a very talented actor. Um, I've gotten to see all aspects of, of, of what you do from voice to in person to uh, scaring, whatever it may be. You, you know how to bring the story to life. Very talented actor. Um... Which obviously leaves the question, we, we have been hearing some rumors of, uh, not really rumors actually, it's kind of been confirmed by them, but uh, Whore Made Here might be returning 2022, um, which begs the question, uh, are you already deciding where you want to go next year? Do you already have a, an idea in mind, or are you kind of one that just rolls with the flow? Like, are you going to 
kind of just go wherever fate leads you to? Well, you know, at this point, uh, first of all, thank you. I want to say thank you for those very kind words. Uh, as a working actor, it is very hard to determine ahead of time where I'm going to be for Halloween and what sort of availability conflicts I might have with other projects. I do voiceover work and television work. Um, so it is kind of hard to, to be able to tell at this point in time. Uh, I have not heard any rumors about Horror Made Here yet, but that's good to hear because I worked for Horror Made Here. For those who don't know, I worked at Warner Brothers Horror Made Here in 2018. I played Patrick Hockstetter, the bully from It and the It Maze, and I had a fantastic time. Uh, whether or not I would be able to return to one of those events, I'm not too sure, but I do uh, perform a lot more immersive theater work now, like through the Mad Cat Motel and the Stranger Things drive-in to experience when both of those attractions were open, I worked there. I'm currently working on an immersive holiday experience in Pomona, uh, and I feel like we're getting a lot of uh, immersive horror attractions that are really starting to come to the forefront, stuff like Delusion. Wait, and, you did, hold uh, on, I gotta pause it real quick. You did, sure. stra you did Stranger Things? I did, yeah. I went like opening freaking weekend, bro. Where who were you playing? <laughs> I was in the Star Court Mall section as the photographer for the Hawkins yearbook. Hi everybody. Okay. Oh, your hair looks so great. I remember you from 1983. So glad you lost the mullet. Let's take your photo. <laughs> I did that. That's uh, awesome, bro. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, a fun know, experience. And it was a fun experience for me to work too, because it was uh, the talking about people, you know, being able to step into stories. The Stranger Things drive-in was an amazing experience for audience members to immediately get on the same page. We're here for the Hawkins reunion. We've got like our car is decorated for Stranger Things. We're wearing 80s clothes. Like everybody was on the same page that we were going to step into this incredible world. And I loved being part of that. And to be able to talk to people, you know, face to face, that's work I love doing. So yeah. at this point in time, can't confirm or deny where I'm going to be because I also don't know, but uh, mm -hmm. I will be continuing work where I get to have interpersonal interactions most likely throughout the next year because that is a specialty and a genuine joy of mine. That connection of storytelling, I love doing that. Yeah, bringing the story to life is uh, honestly one of the most important things uh, for me at least just to be immersed into something. Um, and that's why I like going through mazes. I like storytelling. Uh, Knots is one of my favorite events to tell a story, um, to hear different um stories and whatnot at different events is a, is a, is a truly a blessing. Cause I, I get to be immersed into those stories and kind of be your own kind of character, your surrounding character around these main characters, which is really cool. Um, Absolutely. And you attended the universal Orlando Halloween Horror Nights this year, didn't you? I did a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed it. was the first time ever at universal Orlando in general. Uh, so I got to experience the daytime theme park, got to experience it at night. Um, such a great event, such a great event, and uh, I, I this is unrelated to Halloween, but I really wish Universal over here in Hollywood would get a born stuntacular show because I I was in love with that show. I, I watched it multiple times while I was there for my two days. So, oh, uh, I didn't get a chance to see it. Now I'm bummed that I didn't. It's it's such a good show, and I I just praise the hell out of that production team, everyone that's involved with that show. Such a great time. Um, nice. Yeah. yeah it's great fun. to see that variety of what they're working on, on, on multiple coasts, you know, to get to see what our colleagues in Orlando are doing that sometimes is similar to what we're doing here and sometimes completely different. And same for Hollywood, you know, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman was an exclusive maze for Hollywood. Yeah. So there is a whole chapter of universal monsters history that Hollywood only got. Uh, and the reason I, I brought up Orlando is I think it's one of the best examples of how original storytelling with characters like Jack, the icons and, they have resonated very strongly with the fans in Orlando and to see how that storytelling has become sort of all inclusive and, and people are involved with it with like AR games and VR yeah. games and various things you can do around the park to play with these stories and further immerse in it. I think it's, it's really exceptional. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that in Southern California. I not necessarily through individual companies, but just that seems to be growing in general, that connection to audiences mm -hmm. through original characters and uh, various transmedia to get you to experience it as more than just a walkthrough or more than just a commercial. You know, I think it's really very well done in Orlando. Well, what was cool about it too was one of the mazes that really immersed me into both the, the theme park and the event was uh, Case Files on Earth. Yes. Um, there was a lot of set pieces that uh, afterwards when uh 
we, when we came back the next day, when I came out to hang with my friends, they were showing me, oh, this is that and that, you know, all <laughs> down the New York street and everything. You're seeing everything like, oh, so you saw this, you know, you see this building outside of New York street when we actually went inside of it in the maze. I'm like, oh, that's like, it's really cool, you know, to see all this. Um, cause you, you start really paying attention now. And, you, and then after, you know, after you go through the maze, you go down that area. I mean, there's like no one that ever walks down that area anyway during Horror Nights, but you go down that area to take a look at everything. You're like, oh yeah, that's that. That's this. It's like, this is cool. Another, another fun thing for me, um, to walk through this season during Horror Nights especially was, uh, the exact same alleyway. They filmed their, uh, commercial of where, in the beginning, it shows Jack, like, underground, and you see all the different fears and stuff, and then it pans up into, the, like, the crate, and it's, like, in an alleyway, and you see the actual theme park. Like, to get to walk through that and relive that kind of moment, like, from film to, like, real life, like, it was kind of it's kind of cool because, like, then I walked into a scare zone, and it was like, oh, okay, we're at Horror Nights. Like, this is really cool. Like, this is where they film the commercial and everything. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that event is is very well self-contained in that like it's all grown in-house and it feels like, oh yeah, this is there's that alleyway and here is that building, you know, they their sense of lore and how to bring that to the streets and to the commercials and to the mazes. It's really it's really nice. It's very uh organic the yeah. way they handle that there. And it's it's funny you should mention Sting Alley too because I have occasionally contributed to a site called Haunt Vault. I've contributed some history articles there and their uh, the fan driven story that they've come up with is that the haunt vault is in sting alley in universal Orlando. Right. Uh, and like, you can see like the door where it would be. And there's <laughs> even, I, I think I have it on my shelf here, a comic about the haunt the vault, vault in sting alley. Um, do you know, cryptic guts, the artist in Orlando? Yes. Yeah. Sterling. Yeah. And so they've done an amazing job, like showing like locations from universal Orlando and how that would tie into the haunt vault story, proving That's that there cool. is again, a very um you know simultaneous relationship between the event and its lore and the fans who are now sterling did work for the ar game and for the park you know it's i encourage everyone if you are a fan of these events to also become a working professional in these events because you can appreciate them from a whole other perspective and offer your hand in contributing to these stories you know i don't i think it's safe to say no one telling stories would be telling them if we weren't fans of stories first. Exactly. Now, that being said, AJ, if you ever had the opportunity to go play over in Orlando for a season, would you take it? If I had the opportunity to play in Orlando for a season and didn't have any other commitments tying me down to Los Angeles at yeah. that point in time, yes, I absolutely would. Uh, to be able to experience that event from the guest perspective this year was really special, and I can only imagine it gets better on the other side. Yeah, man. I mean, the only thing you got to worry about there is humidity and rain, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Oh, and and it did. It. I had both of those things. I'm sure you experienced this while you yep. were there. All the Floridians are going to be laughing at me. I'm a native Californian, and mm -hmm. so things strike me as very shocking. When I'm in Florida and it rains, heavy pouring rain for an hour, and then immediately stops, and it's clear the rest of the day. Very I'm not confusing. used to any of that. You know, I'm no. like, I'm, I'm lucky if it rains <laughs> once a freaking year in California. <laughs> like, so you know, and we take advantage of that. We try to make it the best lazy day we can here in California. Honestly. Oh yes. Um, oh yeah. We we try to stay inside from it here, whereas in Florida it was like, oh, just ignore it. Just yeah. ignore the rain. Just walk through it. It's fine. It'll be yeah. clear in 20 minutes. No, like <laughs> I, I literally, it, it started raining on me at the start of the event every single night, which was hilarious. Oh, like, no. As the event was starting, like, the first, like, 15, 20 minutes, it was pouring rain. However, it did look cool when me and my buddy went through, um, what was the uh, the pumpkin maze? Oh, um, yeah, Wicked Growth. Wicked Growth. It looked mm -hmm. cool going in there because the rain was coming down in that, like, kind of, like, that tunnel with, like, the pumpkins and all the leaves and stuff on it. So, like, the rain coming through that and then walking into that pumpkin patch, like, it, it really was, uh, uh, it made the experience a little bit better for me, so. That is very cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and that's something that I've also seen in SoCal. We have very heavy fog in uh, Pomona, and I'm currently working in Pomona for a holiday attraction. And so we're a couple minutes up the street from the house that Delusion is at right now. Nice. So to be able to drive past that and see this historic mansion absolutely cloaked in fog you know in the middle of yeah. the night that is pretty cool so i i can yeah. only imagine that must have been very cool to see in orlando yeah man so i mean it's been a great season man we've had a lot of fun we've gotten to try a lot of new things and get out there and really explore uh what the haunt world has to offer this season whether it be home haunts indie haunts um the theme park haunts you know where whatever it may be i mean we got to experience a lot this season and i'm i'm really grateful for that um 
I, 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 I like to go out there and see what's new and what I haven't seen yet, or if it's a new twist on something that I have seen and it's just new for this season. Like, it's it's cool to see all this stuff. So it, it was a, an absolute pleasure to go and visit everyone, to go show our support to everyone. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel yeah. the same way, you know, to be able to see the way that people who've, for example, like worked for one company spinning off and forming another, or people who have brought fresh ideas to these companies. And, and you know, it's it's been very exciting. I obviously was very busy this Halloween, but I did get a couple of chances to see some other shows out there. Uh, some of my colleagues from Universal formed an immersive company called 8820 Group, and they presented an immersive show at the Bourbon Room called Hollywood and Vamp, which was sort of like a from dusk till dawn type immersive vampire rock nice. show. Um, so to get to see that on one of my days off was very exciting. You know, I think I think you would probably agree, um, whether it's in Orlando or in California, but especially in California right now, Halloween seems bigger than ever. This seasonal theme yeah. entertainment has taken off and it's a, a great time to be alive in this industry. It really is. Uh, it seems like every single year uh, here in SoCal, like there's new events popping up, new experiences, everything. They really want people to experience Halloween to its fullest. Um, and I feel like you don't see that as much with a lot of other seasons. I mean, Christmas may be the second biggest uh, compared to Halloween attraction wise, but I feel like a lot of the times, like uh, other seasons, you're not getting to see as much that Halloween provides, you know what I mean? Because everyone knows how to tap into that horror vibe and make people feel uncomfortable or, you know, scared or whatnot or have a good time in general. Like that's what they're trying to tap into, those senses and whatnot. So Absolutely. And it's a variety. It's sort of like Halloween is literally what the Cabin in the Woods was presenting, how it showed all of those possible different outcomes of horror that you yeah. could you could come into you know there's a lot you can do with christmas and a lot with the holidays around that season that you can also celebrate and showcase you know cultural differences and lights and i like that we're seeing more of that variety in the holiday season now uh halloween has had that for a while as well because you get to see again the family friendly the darker horror stuff and to see the variety just in socal how shows can vary from one to another they can be completely different shows but they're linked together by being halloween and being horror to be able to bring your personal your cultural your uh pop culture uh likes and dislikes to something that is still under the blanket of halloween seasonal themed entertainment i mean that's it's so exciting there's Such so many different time. stories to be told. i 100 percent agree and i and i'm all for it um i'm all for just having more Halloween things to do because it gives me more opportunities to experience new things and become maybe potential fans of things for the future. Uh, no, I, I, I am hoping, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to see delusion this year, but I really wanted to. Um, I think that is a, a fantastic idea for immersive theater. Um, but when you, when you put me in an environment where I get to interact with things and, and kind of be my own little character, like, I'm like I said, I'm a kid in a candy store. Like I, I will, ha I will roll with it and have as much fun as I can because I, it's like, oh, you want me to go pick that thing up? Okay, I'll go do it. I go do it. I'll do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's one of those things where I just get too uh, immersed into it, and I just, I, I have a fun time having, you know, doing it. So, well, hey, that's what Halloween's all about. You yeah. get to be whoever you want, free of judgment. You get to be like whether you are a five year old dressing as your favorite superhero or an adult participating in an immersive theater program about ghosts or vampires, things that some people say can't exist in our normal world. Halloween is about having a chance to bring those stories to life, to play your part in something out of the ordinary. You know and, what I got to know, do on Halloween, man? <laughs> I got to be a a T a dino warrior from the year 3000. I was dressed as a T-Rex whistling, scaring in a haunt. Whoa. See, there you go. That's something that could, that could never happen in the day-to-day -day life, but here you are, Yeah, you know, the yeah. magic of Halloween. Yeah, man. It was, uh, I had a whistle and, uh, my castmates were selling it perfect that, uh, be careful with the dinosaurs. They whistle when they're about to attack. Oh, oh, uh, it, oh. it was, it was supposed to be a B horror <laughs> movie. So, you know, you, you think of the, the ranchiest, cheesiest ideas and you bring that to life so oh yeah never in a million years would you ever see a dinosaur whistling but you saw this oh, one whistling you know what i mean you'll see it on halloween that's yeah. right you will definitely see on it on halloween. halloween and you know just like you said think of the stories none of these stories are real until we bring them to life yep. so at halloween you can unleash your most authentic your most crazy ideas a whistling dinosaur and and people accept it and that is what fun to get everybody on the same page telling these stories i mean you know who can ask for more as a storyteller it was a lot of fun man so i know i i completely agree with you man you can go out be whatever you want do whatever you want and 
just have a fun time doing it. You know what I mean? We're all here to have a good time. And, you know, I, there's a, there's a certain shirt around that I see. It's uh, no hate in SoCal whore. <clears throat> yeah. It's one of my favorites. Um, that's right. To hear that quote, uh, it's true. We should have no hate in SoCal whore. Uh, cause we're all, we're all a community. We're all here to celebrate the same holiday. We're all here to have the same fun and yep. we should all do it safely and respectfully, but have a fun time doing it. That's right. People come from all walks of life, all creeds, all colors, all gender identities to bond over this one magical night, this one magical season rather, you know, and just what can I say? Be excellent to each other and have fun because we all love the same thing and therefore we all love each other. It's time to come together and make that Halloween magic. Halloween magic, man. Well, AJ, I, I, uh, it's always a pleasure sitting. This is your third show that you've done with us here on the uh the channel man and uh it's it's always a pleasure talking with you getting to know with you it, it, it's almost like when talking to you it's like we've never lost contact with it's just we pick up right where we left off and it's it's great i love that i appreciate that my friend right back at you thanks for having me on again yeah man so go ahead and uh you you're on social media right at aj dana that's, that's right. It. That's my Instagram. And yep. I've also got a website, ajdana.com. Go check it out. Go see everything that he's been a part of, everything that he's done. He's got really, really solid resume on him. Um, so go check that out as well. Um, but we want to thank AJ and other monsters who got to play monsters this season, like AJ, um, for bringing the stories to life and immersing us into these worlds. Because without you guys, uh, Halloween, I mean, there's, there's, and, and, don't get me wrong. It's not just scare actors. There's tons of people behind the scenes that we don't even uh, have the pleasure of getting to inter- uh, interview yet because uh, I, I'm trying to work in that field right now. I want to I want to get more people behind the scenes. But until that time comes, I mean, uh, there's tons of people behind the scenes, makeup artists, maze designers, storytellers, um, audio, lighting, uh, effects, everything, production designers. Um, everything that goes into the final product that leads up to what you see opening night, these guys work day and night, blood, sweat, and tears to put all this together. And we thank all of you for that. But, um, I have to say the ones who end up giving us the final story and the ones that we get to see out there are of course the monsters. And we owe it to them to, uh, continue to sell those stories and help us, uh, get immersed into those worlds. And it's a whole collaborative thing in the end. You guys are the That's ones right. that sell the stories that are given to you by the people who create the stories and who create those sets and who create those iconic locations, um, costuming, everything. So thank you, yep. everyone involved with that community, to giving us one of the greatest goddamn shows in the world. Because without you, <laughs> guys, right. without you guys, I mean, we don't have Halloween. And, uh, you know, we it's something we look forward to every season. Honestly, that's right. To everyone out there who's making Halloween, whether you are distributing candy at your house or hanging lights on your house or doing audio set design, makeup costumes, whoever you are out there making Halloween. Thank you. One team, one screen. Yep, there it is. So with that being said, uh, if you guys are new to the channel, hit that subscribe button with that bell notification. Be where every time I put up a new video, we have tons more podcasts coming out, sharing different experiences, different theme parks and whatnot. Um, and also, Follow us on Instagram at the Knights of Four and on Twitter at Knights of Four to keep up to date as to what we're doing with the channel. Any new announcements coming soon? Uh, with all that being said, AJ, thank you for another great season. We can't. We hope to see you next season for something. And to all the monsters out there, we love you. This is this podcast is all about you this season, and we want to continue the love and spread the positivity of Halloween, even though we're approaching Christmas. You know, it never ends for us here at the Knights of Horror. So. With all that being said, we love you guys, and we'll see you guys uh, next time for another podcast. You're moving into a dimension of mind.